Hello, and welcome to part 6 of the Unsolved Mystery Mega Iceberg Explained. Believe it or not, friends, we have finally reached the bottom of layer 2, and what a journey it has been. I'm excited to finish this layer and get into layer 3, so let's not waste time and dive on in. Music on the Moon Everyone knows the story about Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin being the first men on the moon, but did you know, just a month before that landing, three astronauts actually circled the moon as part of the Apollo 10 mission. That mission was to ensure that the spacecraft's lunar lander module could detach and reattach to the command module. It was basically a rehearsal for the real moon landing that would occur with Apollo 11, and it went smashingly well, except for one oddity. When the Apollo 10 spacecraft went to the dark side of the moon, they would lose contact with mission control for two hours, which is normal because the moon blocks telecommunication signals. It was during this two hours, though, that something weird happened. As the crew would decide to have a snack in the midst of this two hours, they would begin to hear a buzzing sound in their headphones. Later versions of this story would state that it was a whistling sound with periodic howling of sorts that lasted almost an hour. Pilot Eugene Cernan would even try to laugh it off by saying, quote, Boy, that sure is weird music, end quote. After landing, NASA would go over the recording and transcripts and mark this space music as classified where it would remain for more than five decades before they would finally release it in 2008, which was certainly odd. People have wondered for years what could explain this phenomenon. NASA's official theory was that the radios on the module were interfering, causing the strange sound, which almost no one believes, especially when you take into consideration the fact that NASA buried the recordings for half a century. To many, this mystery is still unsolved. New Bedford Highway Killer this next one has so many moving parts, and so many people, and other weird things going on, that it's impossible to do it justice in this format. It really needs a full-length video dedicated to it, but I will try to give the best abridged version that I can. The New Bedford Highway Killer is an uncaptured serial killer who is responsible for the deaths of at least nine women and the disappearance of at least two more. The crimes occurred in New Bedford, Massachusetts between March 1988 and April 1989 which is an extremely short window of time for the amount of mayhem he caused. Because in addition to the murders, he is also suspected of numerous assaults on other women. And not surprisingly, all of the victims were known sex workers or had some type of drug addiction, which seems to be typical of serial killers. And while all of the victims were taken from New Bedford, they would end up being found in the surrounding areas, including Dartmouth, Freetown, and Westport, all along Route 140. The list of victims goes as follows. Robin Rhodes, 29. Rochelle Dopiarala, 28. Deborah McConnell, 25. Deborah Maderos, 30. Christina Monterio, 19. Marilyn Roberts, 34. Nancy Pava, 36. Deborah DeMello, 35. Mary Santos, 26. Sandra Botello, 24. And Don Mendez, 25. Eight of the 11 victims were mothers and at least two of the victims knew of or were familiar with the other victims. From what details have been released, we know that at least three of the victims were strangled, while another one was beaten to death. And here's where the story really goes off the rails. The first suspect was a man named Anthony de Grazia, who was a 26-year-old construction worker. He came into the picture when a sex worker named Margaret Maderos would report to the police that she had been assaulted. From her story, detectives believed the man was the highway killer. She would give her description of the attacker, and detectives would bring back a picture of Anthony de Grazia. Margaret would look at the picture and said he looked similar to the man that assaulted her, but she couldn't identify him for sure. But it didn't matter, because authorities were desperate for an arrest. So de Grazia would be arrested in connection with 17 of the assaults. The judge would then purposely set the bell too high for de Grazia to get out. And keep in mind, there was no evidence, with the lone victim not even being able to identify him. This was done in the attempt to give the prosecutor time to come up with proof that de Grazia was the highway killer. But after spending a year and a half in jail, de Grazia would hire a new lawyer who filed a contempt of court against the DA because they had not brought any evidence forward and they were holding him indefinitely. The judge had no choice but to lower his bail. De Grazia would finally be released, and I wish I was making this next part up, but he was arrested shortly after because he was allegedly heard uttering a threat to that DA for his wrongful imprisonment. De Grazia would again post bail, and again he was released. A month later, 
he would be found dead under a picnic table. His death was ruled a homicide by the police. That was confirmed by the autopsy. But the DA's office, yeah, they said it was a suicide. And although no evidence was ever brought forward, it didn't matter. Because they were on to the next suspect. Kenneth Ponte, who was a defense attorney in New Bedford, would be the next man accused in the murders. After he was charged in the death of Rochelle Dopirala, the second victim of the highway killer, who Ponte supposedly beat to death because she was allegedly planning to expose his drug activities, but the charges would be dropped because lack of evidence, and then he too would pass away from a mysterious suicide. There have been several other suspects over the years, and also attempts to link their murders to the Long Island serial killer, which I covered in another video, as well as an attempt to connect them with the Connecticut River Valley killer. The FBI even went to Portugal to try and connect it to the Lisbon Ripper. To this day, the case remains unsolved. Ningen, Ningen, which is Japanese for human, is a cryptid that is said to inhabit the Antarctic Oceans. Much of the information on this creature comes from a series of posts in 2012 on a forum called Two Channel, which claimed the members of a whale research ship witnessed seeing this cryptid. The creature is said to be like that of a whale, but has anatomical similarities to humans, in particular, the face, but also extremely large limbs and or arms and hands. The creature itself is about 65 to 100 feet long. It is pale blue and has a large slit-like mouth and small or large gaping eyes. The story would catch on, and by 2005, Google Earth would capture what many claim to be a Ningen near the Southern Ocean, although skeptics have pointed out that it was most likely an iceberg. And by 2010, a Japanese chemical research company would publish a video on YouTube showing what looked like to be a large creature with small eyes and a large smiling slit-like mouth laying on the ocean floor. This would again be used by believers of the cryptid as proof that the Ningen did exist. But again, many skeptics believe the creature was nothing more than a snaggletooth snake eel. However, since the origin of this creature can be traced back to a series of posts on 2 Channel, in which the person writing describes the creature based on an experience working on a government well research vessel. Well, it's most likely nothing more than a well-crafted hoax. Ohio City Serial Pooper This next one is one of the funnier ones on this iceberg, and it's only made funnier by the fact that there are two more poop stories to go after this one. Ohio City is a trendy neighborhood in Cleveland, Ohio. It's known for its dining and entertainment. However, in 2016, residents of this neighborhood would start to complain about a peculiar problem. Apparently, someone was going through the area and, well, taking a dump in their yard. But it wasn't just here at the residential areas either. It was at the local businesses, where the owners would find the walkways to their businesses had been desecrated. News Channel 5 would actually do a story on this and talk to the police, who said there was no official complaint that had been made. To this day, the perpetrator has not been caught. Old Craigslist Satanic Ritual Post now we move on to a creepy one. In 2019, someone would post a question to the Reddit sub called Reddit Bureau of Investigation, which is dedicated to Redditors coming together to try and solve mysteries. On this post, he would state the following, quote, There's a Craigslist post that was titled, Donate Blood to Satanic Ritual. Apparently, the group had taken five lives and the blood of ten others. Before another victim was found, however, the police showed up and found four men standing over a pentagram full of blood. I'm researching cults right now, and this would be an absolute treasure piece to put in my paper. I can't for the life of me find any article relating to the arrest of said individuals, and will not include this in my paper if I can't reference real sources. Another issue is that any photo I can find of the ad has the original time and meet and place address either blacked out or completely removed. Because of that, I can't search for a specific city this could have occurred in. Can anyone help me find an article on this? Or is this just folklore that didn't really happen?" End quote. The Redditors would try to help the original poster, but they were all perplexed, as they had never heard anything remotely similar to this. They would all come into agreement that the story was most likely nothing more than an urban legend. Origins of Golf Have you ever wondered how golf got its start? Yeah, me neither. But apparently there is a heated debate on which country is responsible for its creation. And while most generally consider it to be a Scottish invention, there are a ton of earlier accounts of a golf-like game that comes from all over continental Europe. The earliest mention comes from 1261 in a Middle Dutch manuscript, where Flemish poet 
Jacob Van Marilont mentioned a ball game with a colf, which is a club. Over the next 400 years, there would be several documented accounts that reference people playing colf, such as the Brussels City Council in 1360, who set a law stating, quote, he who played colf pays a fine of 20 shillings, end quote. All the way up to 1650, when the early Dutch settlers in New York would play the first ever round of golf in America. But the people who defend the theory that golf is a Scottish invention point out that golf is a completely different game than golf. A spokesman for the Royal and Ancient Golf Club of St. Andrews stated, quote, Stick and ball games have been around for many centuries, but golf as we know it today played over 18 holes, clearly originated in Scotland, end quote. Having said that, there's no denying the word golf is taken from the Dutch word golf or cove, meaning stick or club. Golf, on the other hand, had its first mention in Scotland in 1457, as King James II of Scotland issued an edict forbidding the playing of the games golf and football, as these were a distraction from archery practice, which was needed for military purposes. However, and this is where all the controversy really is, if we go back to the Dutch claims of creating golf, there's a record from February 26, 1297, from the village of Lonen on de Vecht, where the players of the game used a stick with a leather ball. The winner was whoever could hit the ball with the fewest strokes and to a target several hundred yards away. This is pretty much the game of golf. But the problem is, scholars do not believe this account is legit. And finally, even though it's widely accepted that the modern game was created in Scotland, we know that it took most of its inspiration and rules from older games. That is also a mystery, because historians have no idea where the original game came from. One of the first, comes from the ancient Roman game called Paganica, in which players hit a feather stuffed leather ball with a club-shaped tree branch. It was played all over the Roman Empire during the first century BC. So where did golf originally come from? We will probably never know. Oven Homicide In December of 1960, Hika Saarinen, who was 33, lived with her husband, Penti Saarinen, in their large historic wooden house. The couple had a total of five children, who were all taken out of the home by the state and placed into foster care due to Penty's violent outburst, which according to the neighbors, Penty was extremely jealous and violent towards Hika when he was drinking. He at times would even threaten to kill her in such a way that it could not be traced. That Christmas, the couple's eldest son Seppo, who was now 13, would go to see his parents for the holidays. He would also bring one of his schoolmates along, but Seppo, well, he ended up going a day earlier than when he told his parents he was coming. When he got there, him and his friend found the front door unlocked. They would walk across the entry room and foyer when Penty emerged from the kitchen, then immediately shut the door behind him and locked it. He would then block the boy's way, asking him why he came home a day early. Seppo would ask where his mother was, and Penty replied that she had left while he was getting firewood, thinking it was weird, but not super alarmed. The boy stayed. When it was dark, they would go to get some bed sheets from the master bedroom, but they had to make their way through the kitchen, which was now unlocked, to get there. Seppo would see that the kitchen was dark and ask Penty about it. His father replied that the lamp was broken, but a sliver of light poked through the hallway, and Seppo saw the miscellaneous junk that used to sit on the large oven over the years had now been tossed onto the floor. Penty would tell his son that he had been cleaning, which again was odd since it was dark. During this time as the boys were getting some bed sheets, Penty would follow them closely, acting nervously and paranoid. Seppo's school friend at this point was very creeped out and decided to leave. About a month after this, a neighbor reported Hika missing. She also noted that Penty was opening all the windows to air out the place, which was odd because Finland in January is super cold. And finally, she reported a strange smell coming from his chimney. The police did follow up, but they never gathered anything useful. It was here that Penty would also change his story, and he said his wife had left while he was sleeping. After this, Seppo would visit occasionally, even staying for days at some point. It was during this time he would start to get curious and would inspect parts of his home. In particular, he was puzzled by the disappearance of a pile of sand that used to sit near the barn. By 1966, a full six years later, Seppo would write a letter to the police explaining the situation and encouraging the police to inspect the oven. Strangely, the police ignored the letter, but the following year, Seppo would write another letter, this time under a fake name and to a local newspaper, entitled, quote, Where did they disappear? I suspect my father is a murderer, end quote. 
Penthe's father would actually end up seeing this in the newspaper, and he would tell his son, quote, We both should just take care of our own things, end quote. Finally, by 1972, new detectives were assigned to go through some code cases, and investigators would come across the letter and contacted Seppo. And on November 27th, 12 years after her disappearance, police would arrive to the home and dismantled the oven. They discovered the oven had been filled with sand, about three foot deep. In that sand, they found the mummified head of a woman. They would eventually find the rest of the body, and it would be confirmed the next day as belonging to Hika. However, the coroner could not find any signs of injury during autopsy, and was also unable to rule out that she had been put into the oven alive. Penty denied the charges, obviously. Numerous witnesses came forward claiming Hika had complained about Penty hitting her. She also had repeated doctor visits over the years from resulting injuries. The prosecutor did, though, neglect to mention that Penty had borrowed 75 crime fiction novels from the library months leading up to her disappearance. Many of those books about murdering one's wife. But still, this was a slam dunk case, right? Well, the court actually decided that Penty had not caused her death on purpose and would sentence him to eight years for manslaughter. But, and this is the frustrating part, the Supreme Court of Finland freed him after claiming that neither the cause nor manner of Hika's death was known and that even if it was an accidental killing, one cannot be charged for that after 12 years. Penty returned home and lived out his life there until 1986 when he finally passed away. The police would reopen the case as an unsolved murder. Pamela Buckley and James Freund at 6.20 a.m. on August 9, 1976. A truck driver named Martin Durant would come across two bodies on the side of a road in Sumter County, South Carolina, one male and one female. The location was a secluded dirt road between I-95 and SC-341 and was a spot truck driver sometimes pulled over to rest. The truck driver would call a nearby store and report it to employees Charles Graham, who in turn called the police. Upon initial investigation, detectives realized that they had been shot in the back as they stepped out of a vehicle most likely a van. The couple had then been rolled over and shot again in their necks under their chins, as well as one shot to the chest. Police suspected they had been the victim of a hijacking or that they had been hitchhikers. One witness, a man living in the sticks, said he heard a car rushing down the narrow road next to I-95 and then someone climbed out, gunshots echoed, and then the car raced back onto the interstate. The male victim was in his late 20s and the female was in her early 20s. Both were clean cut and well kept. The young man had expensive dental work along with an expensive watch, which led to early thought that they'd come from a wealthy family. Detectives would run down many leads over the years. They were sure the male's name started with a J, since the initials JPF were engraved on his ring. They also found matches in his pocket that came from a truck stop chain in Idaho, Nebraska, and Arizona. The female wore jewelry that was most likely Native American or Mexican costume jewelry and was likely from the Southwest. Decades would pass until 2021, when the two were finally identified using genetic genealogy research. The two, as you are now well aware of, because they are on the iceberg, were Pamela Buckley and James Freund, who were two hitchhikers that had met on their travels. Pamela was a 25-year-old who was from Minnesota, but was last seen in Colorado Springs in December of 1975. James Freund was 30, and was last seen in Lancaster, Pennsylvania in December 1975. Pamela had been reported missing, but James wasn't. But now that that half of the mystery was solved, what about the other half? Just who killed them? Strangely enough, a year later, a man would be arrested for DUI in Latta, South Carolina, about 70 miles from where the bodies were found. He had in his possession a gun that looked like the one used in the murders. The serial number had been partially filed away, but it didn't matter because detectives were able to confirm that it was indeed their murder weapon. The man, whose name was Lonnie Henry, would actually end up passing a polygraph test when it came to question him about the murder, at least. But he did show deception when he was asked about where he got the gun. Henry would claim that he had gotten the gun from his brother as a birthday gift. That brother would state that when he had given it to him, the serial number was still there. Henry would finally admit that he did file the serial numbers off, but he would never say why. But the most crazy thing about this gun was that it had originally been stolen by a group of thieves who operated in Raleigh. It was only after this that Henry came into possession of it. Henry would die in 1982 without giving any more information, leaving the question, 
Did he loan the gun to someone who used it in their murder? Then Henry found out, panicked, and tried to file the serial number off? Or maybe he realized that the gun he had came into possession of had been used in their murder beforehand? Or was it possible that Henry was so drunk and had no memory of killing the couple, thus tricking the polygraph? Since James's watch was not stolen, robbery is believed to have not been the motive. There's been several crazy theories put forth over the years. One big one was that they were drug smuggling, which people point to the execution-style murder as proof. There's also a ton of corruption in that small town. Several prominent businessmen and politicians were all implicated in three murder-for-hire schemes. That includes the bank president and mayor, as well as the police chief being murdered by another police officer. There's also more mundane theories out there, like the duo were killed by a jealous lover. While it remains unknown, the Sumter County Sheriff stated in 2021 that the case was reopened and they already had persons of interest. Here's to hoping that 2023 brings some closure to the families. Potomsky Crater The Potomsky Crater, also known as the Padam Crater, is a large rock formation located in the southeastern part of Siberia. It is a large mound made of shattered limestone blocks. It was not discovered until 1949 by geologist Vadim Kopakov. After hearing stories of an evil place in the woods, the natives called it Fire Eagle Nest because it sort of looked like an eagle's nest with an egg inside. According to the natives, deer wouldn't go near it, and the reason it's on this list is because, well, no one knows what caused it. Scientists do know, though, that the crater is about 250 years old, and the mound has a diameter of 520 feet and a height of 139 feet. In the middle of the depressed center is a rounded hill with a height of 39 feet. Its origins have been a subject of debate for scientists for almost a century. For the majority of time since the crater has been discovered, most scientists believe that it had been caused by a pretty big meteorite that had hit and sunk into the earth. Some originally speculated that it was a fragment of the Tagunska meteorite that hit in 1908, but that was ruled out once they learned the crater was over 200 years old. This has led some to consider that the crater is volcanic in origin, or possibly an outbreak of gas from inside the earth. All the more paranormal theories claim that it was left by an ancient civilization or ancient aliens, or possibly a secret Stalin-era gulag that was used to mine uranium. Some have even speculated that it was a nuclear blast. While the Siberian indigenous peoples have long said the crater was cursed and called it the devil's place, and they avoided it as it was dangerous to humans. After many expeditions to the center, scientists still have no idea where it came from. Phone calls from beyond the grave. We discussed a very famous case of this back on part four of the iceberg, when we discussed the Charles Peck phone calls, which if you remember, 35 phone calls were made to family and friends after he tragically died in a commuter train crash. This entry on the iceberg is the same subject, except it looks at the phone calls beyond the grave phenomenon as a whole, whereas the Charles Peck case was just the most famous one. But there are numerous other examples. We'll look at some taken from some Reddit posts. Plank Ashton 14 would recall that after his grandmother passed from cancer, the family fallout, which sometimes occurs after a death in the family, started to cause him a lot of stress. He would start to wear his Fitbit when he worked, just in case there was some type of emergency at home. He'd have his phone on him. He would end up crying and pleading for his now deceased grandmother to ease his worries, and one night he would awake to his Fitbit vibrating like crazy. And it would say that he had missed calls from his grandmother, one from her cell phone and one from the landline. The cell phone had already been disconnected at this point. And as far as the landline, his grandfather would have been in bed at this time since it was 3 a.m. So he did not think that he would have made the call. He would then state that he grabbed his phone and there was no notifications at first. But then two voicemails popped up. One said, quote, I hope all is well with school, work, and your mom. I love you. And just remember that always, put your stress and worries aside. Call me back soon. End quote. The poster would go on to say that after this, that he didn't even need to listen to the second message. Redditor Salty Panda 93 would state a week that after his great-grandmother passed away, he was visiting with his grandparents when they got a weird call on the landline phone, one where the caller ID showed only zeros. His grandfather didn't answer, probably assuming that it was a robocaller, and left the answering machine to get it. A minute later, the answering machine showed one message. They played it, and after 10 seconds of static, they heard a woman's voice say, quote, I love you, end quote. 
a few more seconds of static, and then the message ended. They all recognized the voice as their great-grandmother. Finally, we'll look at one last case from user Mandy Lynn 1109 who stated that when she was 11, her grandpa died after a long fight with lung cancer. During his fight with cancer, they had gotten help from a home health nurse who had came three days a week to take care of him. He would pass on the morning of November 27, 1994. And strangely enough, when the nurse went back home, she had a message on her answering machine from 1.30 p.m. On the message, the old man said, quote, Tell June I'm all right, end quote, which June was the nickname of his wife, the Redditor's grandmother. These are just three examples, but there are numerous other accounts. Even before the internet was in every home and on every device, people told stories about calls beyond the grave. I would almost bet someone watching this video right now has had one of these calls. But what exactly to make of this? Well, maybe it's not too surprising but there's not been much study on this phenomenon. But there are a few theories. The most likely one is that it's a trick of the brain, that when a person is in severe mourning, they can subconsciously produce these phone calls to console themselves. Another theory believed by people of faith is that it's a guardian angel trying to bring comfort to the affected individual. And finally, well, some people believe it really is their loved one reaching out from beyond the grave. But what do you think? Playboy Channel Religious Message for all you Zoomers out there, Playboy magazine was a men's lifestyle and entertainment magazine that started in 1953. It's mostly known for its nude and semi-nude models, which played a pivotal role in the development of many teenage boys that looked under their dad's mattress when they were growing up. The magazine would eventually get its own pay-per-view television channel in 1980, and it's really hard to fathom now, but at one time, Playboy was seen by many of the more conservative religious types to be an absolute evil. And that might be the cause of this next mystery. Because on September 6, 1987, during a showing of the film Three Daughters, a television hijack would occur. In the middle of the movie, a message would pop up on the screen saying, quote, Thou sayest the Lord thy God, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Repent the kingdom of heaven is at hand. End quote. Which are the verses from Exodus chapter 20, verse 8, and Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. Unlike that of the Max Headroom hijacking we previously covered, the person behind this one would actually be captured. His name was Thomas Haney, and I can't believe the next part, but he actually worked for the Christian Broadcasting Network, which I will now refer to as CBN. He would end up being convicted of satellite piracy in connection with the incident. He ended up serving three years for probation, and a $1,000 fine, and 150 hours of community service. But, there was some doubt about his guilt. The FCC claimed, that due to the religious content of the hijacking and the type of equipment used, they were able to trace it back to CBN. However, CBN's defense was that the FCC's case was entirely circumstantial since there was no witnesses and since the incident could not be traced to a point of origin. And while normally, this defense would just be seen as an attempt by CBN to just get out of a punishment, but there was some merit to it. In fact, the FCC would try to recreate the incident using CBN's equipment, and they were never able to do it. CBN would further state that they lacked the power to hijack a signal. The jury was actually deadlocked at first, but eventually agreed to two of the six charges brought up by the prosecution. This mystery was a media mystery slash lost media mystery, because if it's true that CBN wasn't responsible, then who was and why? Secondly, the only thing that remains from this hijacking is this one lone picture, though there was a video that has popped up recently that was supposedly taken from the hijacking, but it seems like this was most likely a fake. Poison Pen Murder In 1976, in a small town called Circleville, Ohio, a woman named Mary Gillespie, who was a school bus driver, would receive a letter telling her that the writer was aware that she was having an affair with the superintendent of schools and that she had better stop. The letter would also say, quote, I know where you live, I've been observing your house, and know you have children. This is no joke. Please take it serious, end quote. The envelope itself was postmarked Columbus, Ohio, with no return address and no signature. She had no way of knowing who it could be. A week later, she would receive another, and yet Mary kept quiet. It was shortly after this that her husband Ron would receive one too, and it said that if Ron did not stop his wife's affair, his life was in danger. Two weeks later, Ron would receive another one that said, quote, Gillespie, you have had two weeks and done nothing. Make her admit the truth and inform the school board. If not, 
I will broadcast it on CBs, posters, signs, and billboards until the truth comes out, end quote. Mary and Ron will confide the secret in three people, and Ron's sister and her husband, Paul Freshour, and Paul's sister. The letters would stop for a while at this point, but on August 19th, 1977, Ron would receive a phone call. He would then tell his children he was going out to confront the rider, and he angrily went to his red and white pickup truck and left. But just a short distance up the road, at an intersection he knew very well, he somehow lost control of his vehicle, and he hit a tree and died. But more mysteriously, his gun had fired one shot. The sheriff would interview and rule out one suspect. Then shortly thereafter, claimed that Ron had been drunk driving, with an alcohol blood content one and a half times the legal limit. However, Ron's kids would state that when he left, he was not drunk, as well as many of Ron's family and friends would state that he was not the type to drink heavy anyways, so it seemed odd to them. Fast forward to 1983, the letter writing was still occurring, and as Mary was on her bus route, she noticed that someone had started standing up signs along her route, signs about Mary, but it wasn't until one of these signs threatened Mary's child that she took action. She would stop the bus and rip the sign down, but behind the sign was box and string on a post that was attached to a fence post. She took it to the bus and opened it, only to realize that it was actually a crudely made booby trap that was supposed to have fired at her, but failed. The gun would be turned over to police, and although the serial number had been filed off, they were still able to recover it and trace the gun to Paul Freshour, Mary's brother-in-law, who had just split up with Ron's sister. But Paul would deny it, of course, and claim that he didn't know how his gun even ended up missing. The case would go to trial, though, and a handwriting expert did match the letters to other writings by Paul, as well as Paul's boss testified that Paul did not go into work the day the booby trap was found. Paul would be sentenced 7 to 25 years for the attempted murder, but the letters continued, all of them postmarked in Columbus, many miles from where Paul was imprisoned at. The sheriff would even request that the warden put Paul in isolation to stop them, and he did, but it still did not work. However, according to a journalist covering the case, the sheriff hid crucial information in this case. As a witness came forward and stated that on the day the booby trap had been planted, she spotted a man parked nearby who was driving a yellow El Camino, and he had gotten out on the side of the road near where the trap was, and he was doing something. When he realized he was spotted, he pretended to be urinating. The man was large and had sandy colored hair, and the man was not Paul. So who is behind all this exactly? People are divided on this crazy story, and there's multiple theories, but for the sake of time, I'll break it down to this. Was Paul guilty of the letter writing or not? Well, the gun on the botch trap was his gun, and as recent as 2021, 48 hours did a special on this case, and they hired a forensic document expert who stated in her opinion, the Circleville letters no doubt matched other documents written by Paul. However, defenders of Paul claimed that all of the letters sent out when Paul was in prison should exonerate him, and they doubt that he had an accomplice sending out pre-written letters, which many people claim. And FBI profiler Mary O'Toole has claimed that looking at the writings denote a female writer. This has led many to believe the perpetrator was Paul's wife Karen Sue, or possibly Ron's own wife, Mary. Portland Pooper On to our second pooper story. In 2015, a man in Portland, Oregon would start his reign of terror by, well, you already know. He would actually start going to a local business loosening his belt, leaning up against the office, and then doing his business. This would happen at least three times until the owner would finally put up a security camera in the window. The man would do it again, and after a few minutes, he would turn around to notice that he was on camera. The business owner would actually make a flyer with the man's face and post it all over the area. A local news affiliate covering the story would take the flyer to a nearby gas station, where an employee said he recognized the man, but he did not have a name. As of this recording, police are still trying to flush the suspect out. Princes in the Tower On April 9, 1483, King Edward IV of England would die from an unexpected illness, although some say he was poisoned, that lasted around three weeks. King Edward was one of the central figures of the Wars of the Roses, which was a series of civil wars in England, fought between the Yorkist and Lancastrian factions between 1455 and 1487 and is probably more relevant today 
due to the Games of Thrones series, which the series was heavily based on, except for, you know, name changes, and instead of cannons, there were dragons. But now that you kind of get a gist for just what was going on at this time, you get a better understanding of this next mystery. King Edward had two sons, one who was 12 and the other was 9. The eldest was expected to become King Edward V, and at the time of King Edward IV's death, the new king in waiting was at Ludlow Castle, but Edward's brother Richard, Duke of Gloucester, was at Middleham Castle in Yorkshire. The news would reach him by the 15th of April, just six days later, although it's possible that he knew his brother was very sick. Now King Edward had left his brother as the Lord Protector, which basically made him a regent. And if my 1000 plus hours playing Europa Universalis 4 has told me anything, it's that a regency council is never a good thing. Basically, it made Richard the King until the 12-year-old son of King Edward was ready to take over. You can probably see where this is going by now. As both the Prince and Richard made their way to London, they would meet at a town called Stony Stratford on April 29th. In what was probably the first clue that things were not going well, Richard arrested Prince Edward's entourage, including their uncle and half-brother, who would both eventually be beheaded. Richard would then take possession of the Prince, and he headed to London. Meanwhile, the boy's mother, Elizabeth Woodville, would take the younger son into hiding. Edward and Richard would then live together, while plans for Edward's official coronation were underway. He was supposed to become the new king officially on May 4th, but this was pushed back to June 25th. He would end up staying in the Tower of London, which was the traditional place where the king and waiting stayed. And by June 16th, his younger brother would come out of hiding and joined Edward. It was then that Richard would indefinitely postpone the coronation. And shortly after this, he would begin to pull the political strings to have the marriage between the now deceased King Edward and his wife Elizabeth declared invalid. This in turn caused both princes to be deemed as illegitimate to take the throne. Richard would then be made king. This is why Stannis Baratheon's character is based on King Richard III. Now the real mystery begins. What happened to the boys? Well, we know from an Italian friar named Dominic Mancini, who was visiting London in the 1480s, we record in the spring and summer of 1483 that Edward and his younger brother were moved to the inner apartments of the tower and were seen less and less over time until they eventually vanished. We also know that up until the summer of 1483, the two princes were seen playing outside on the tower ground, but this was the last time they were seen outside the tower walls. After this is when varying theories start, because in 1483, an uprising called Buckingham's Rebellion would begin. This was meant to overthrow King Richard, rescue Prince Edward, and then put him back on the throne as king. The rebellion failed, but it was a significant uprising that no doubt shook King Richard. It's because of this, many historians believe that both boys would be killed during or after the rebellion. However, this is disputed, because a document from the following year of July 1484 outlined the house rules set by King Richard, and one line sticks out, quote, the children should be together at one breakfast." End quote. Now was this a reference to the two princes? Or could it have been some of the other children living there? No one is for sure. But most historians believe that the boys were killed no later than the summer of 1483, at the hands of Richard, or at the hands of someone else ordered by Richard. He had always claimed his innocence, but he never ordered an investigation into it. There are a few other theories out there, but come on, it was Richard. Pseudo Nero this next one is a bizarre history mystery. Almost everyone knows that Nero was a Roman emperor who supposedly fiddled while Rome burnt, which of course was propaganda made up by Nero's rivals since fiddles had not even existed yet. But did you know that after he committed suicide in June of 68 AD, at least three different men claiming to be Nero would burst onto the scene. But before we discuss these imposters, why did this even come about? Well, there's actually a few reasons. For one, was the location of his suicide, which was near the villa of his former slave and confidant, Phaon, which citizens didn't typically imagine. Something like that from someone as prestigious as the emperor, but even ignoring that. We also had the fact that Nero was denied the luxurious burial that other emperors and members of the imperial family received, and he was also denied burial at the mausoleum of Augustus, where the other Julio-Claudian emperors lay. And while this was probably because the Senate hated Nero, he would have caused the average Roman, who loved Nero, to be suspicious. But maybe the reason that the citizens of Rome really bought into this 
was because of a circulation of prophecies, the said Nero would regain his kingdom in the east, and possibly that it would even begin in Jerusalem. These prophecies were largely based on Nero's birth chart, which according to his horoscope said, he would lose everything he inherited from his father, only to recover it back in the east. So it's easy to see where the average Roman might buy into the conspiracy that Nero had not died. As far as the imposters go, just who were they? Well, the first one appeared in the fall of 68 AD, just a few months after Nero died, or early in 69 AD during the winter. He came from Achaia, or what is today called Greece, which the real Nero was famous for his connection to, and he had visited shortly before his suicide. The man would gain quite a bit of following, mostly of adventurers, army deserters, and runaway slaves, whom he promised would find great riches if they followed him. They would then set out to sea, and the group would be blown off course by a storm, and landed at the island of Kethnos. From here, he supposedly built up his money by acts of piracy. He would then start to make an appeal to Roman soldiers who were on their way back to Italy to join his growing force. It's then that Galba, the emperor who really succeeded Nero, would task someone to hunt down the imposter. It wouldn't take long before the pretender was found, and Roman soldiers stormed his ship and killed him. His head would then be taken to tour Asia and Rome. According to Tacitus, who was one of the greatest Roman historians, the whole reason this guy was believed was not due to how convincing he was, but it was more due to how gullible the Greeks were. But this is a bit biased, because Tacitus spoke poorly of the Greeks in general, and although he didn't know much about the first imposter, he did go on to note that he was either a slave from Pontus or a freedman from Italy. The second pretender we actually know the real identity of, so this part of the mystery is solved. His real name was Terentius Maximus. The crazy thing was he actually looked like Nero, as well as singing, and playing the lyre, which was the string instrument Nero really played, not the fiddle. Since this part of the mystery has resolution, I won't go over it too much, other than to say he went to Rome's historic rival Parthia in an attempt to have them help him gain the throne in Rome. His ruse would be discovered fairly quickly, and he was ordered to be executed by the Parthian king. Finally, the last imposter we know very little about. In fact, we only have one line about him. That comes from the Roman historian Suetonius, who wrote, quote, When I was a young man, a person of obscure origin appeared, who gave out that he was Nero, and the name was still in such favor with the Parthians that they supported him vigorously and surrendered him with great reluctance, end quote. So considering we know almost nothing about him, it seems he didn't have much of an impact. Queen West Mystery Pooper Okay, this is just getting ridiculous now. Another pooper, this time in the Queen West community of Toronto. In 2018, this man of mystery would get up early in the mornings before the sleepy little neighborhood awoke and would go to drop a dookie on someone's property and even one time at a local elementary school. The man often had a Tim Hortons cup in tow, which meant he had the opportunity to use the restroom there. He also brought toilet paper with him, indicating that it was a premeditated poo. He has been captured on camera, and just like others, would end up having his picture plastered across the neighborhood, looking for information about him. And in spite of the pictures all over the area, he has never been identified. And while it may seem funny, it's still a crappy situation for the community. Queensland Tiger The Queensland Tiger is a cryptid that is said to live in Queensland, in eastern Australia. The cat is about the size of a medium dog, and about four to five feet long including the tail. It is said that the height of the shoulder reaches about a foot and a half. The cat is much heavier and more muscular than a typical house cat. Its legs are relatively short, and its paws and claws are large. Its teeth are often described as tusk or fangs. It also has green eyes and pointy ears like those of a cat. Its coat is said to be short and has black stripes. Under the stripes is said to be a tan color. It's known for its notoriously aggressive nature, and its habitat is near the mountains or thick rainforest where it can feed on tree kangaroos and rock wallabies. The earliest documented reports came from 1871, when a police magistrate's 13-year-old son would chase a striped cat up a tree. The boy's dog would then growl at the cat, which triggered the beast to come down the tree and lunge at the dog and then the boy. The boy would then quickly run inside the home and told his father. The father would then assemble a party to go search for the feline, but they could never find anything but the tracks. There's so many other stories like this, that I can't possibly cover them all, but I will say that 
Allegedly, a huge number of these were killed by early settlers and were never kept or documented, as well as reports going way back from the Aborigines. In 1979, Carl Wumholtz, best known for his field research, would write, quote, I learned that on the summit of the Coast Mountains, before mentioned, there lived two varieties of mammals, which seemed to me to be unknown to science, but I had much difficulty in acquiring this knowledge. One of the animals, the local Aborigines, called Yari. From their description, I conceived it as a marsupial tiger. It was said to be about the size of a dingo, though its legs were shorter and its tail long, and it was described as being very savage. If pursued, it climbed up the trees, where the natives did not dare follow it, and by gestures, they explained to me how such times he would growl and bite their hands. Rocky retreats were said to be its most favorite habitat, and its principal food was said to be little brown variety of wallaby, common in northern Queensland scrubs. Its flesh was not particularly appreciated, and if they accidentally killed a yari, they gave it to their old women. In western Queensland, I heard much about the animal, which seemed to me to be identical with the yari here described, and a specimen was once nearly shot by an officer of the black police in the regions I was now visiting." End quote. Then going forward about a half a century in 1926, Zoologist A.S. Lasoff documented the animal as still existing when he described it as a, quote, striped marsupial cat, end quote, in his book, The Wild Animals of Australasia. Then we go to the 1970s, when a researcher would compile over 200 sightings of the cryptid over the past century, but the sightings would die down towards the end of the 20th century. Still, there had been a few documented encounters. One of the last was from 2017 when a man driving through Queensland at 1 a.m. said he was traveling in his ute when he seen the creature trotting for about 350 feet on the road before it turned off into the bush. He at first thought it was a huge fox with mange or had some kind of illness. He would then start to Google the animal characteristics until he found the animal that matched what he seen, which ended up being the Queensland tiger. There's actually a few sightings like this from the 2000s. The feline has been described as the cryptid closest to official recognition, but yet, there's still been no body turn up, just stories. If the cat is or was real, it's thought to be a survivor or descendant of a now extinct marsupial lion, while others speculate that it's a variant of the also extinct Tasmanian tiger, which we discussed on part three of this iceberg. There's also the theory that if the cat did exist, it went extinct around the early to mid 1900s. And finally, some biologists chalk it up to nothing more than a feral cat. I actually think this one is real, but I'm curious what you all think, especially if you live in Australia. Running Pooper So I made a mistake earlier, saying there was three poopers on this iceberg, because there's actually four. This one involved a young female runner, which you typically wouldn't imagine for this sort of thing, who stopped at this one homeowner's house in Albuquerque, New Mexico on her runs. She even stopped one Easter Sunday, but she was not dumping off eggs. The homeowner at first thought it was a homeless person, or perhaps someone that was possibly just sick and had an accident, but he started noticing her doing it again and again. He finally, like others on this list, put up a hidden camera and caught her in the act, but instead of going to the police, he would go to a local news station in hopes of shaming her, and they were more than happy to oblige, and they end up playing it on the evening news, but again, like the others, no one ever identified her. The mysterious young lady was later spotted running a marathon. She was unable to take first place, but she did end up taking number two. And with that, I'm out of poop puns. St. Valentine's Day Massacre At 10.30 a.m. on Valentine's Day in 1929, seven men from the Bugs Moran gang would be lured to an abandoned warehouse in the neighborhood of Lincoln Park in Chicago, under the guise of getting a cut of a stolen shipment of whiskey. After they arrived, a Cadillac sedan would pull up, and stop in front of the garage, and four men got out, two of whom were dressed as police officers, and they all entered the warehouse. The two fake police officers would order Bugs Moran gang up against the wall. They, along with two men dressed in civilian clothes, would then open fire with Thompson submachine guns and proceeded to mow the men down. Witnesses would state that after this, the two men in police uniforms would lead the men dressed in civilian clothes out at gunpoint which was just to give the illusion that the police had everything under control, so no witnesses would call the real police. The victims were as follows. Peter Gusenberg, Frank Gusenberg, 
Albert Kachelik, Adam Heyer, Reinhard Schwimmer, Albert Weinshank, and John May. And as previously mentioned, five of these were in the North Side Gang, which was headed by George Bugs Moran. Surprisingly, Frank Gusenberg survived the initial onslaught, despite being shot 14 times, and was taken to the hospital. Police would ask him who was behind it, and he said, quote, No one shot me, end quote. But things would then take a turn for the worse, and Frank would die just a few hours later. Detectives quickly surmised that the massacre was an attempt to kill Bugs Moran, which ultimately failed, and the person behind it was most likely Al Capone, the most famous gangster in history. He's basically the guy that every gangster movie character is based on. He is the OG. And it was over nothing more than Capone wanted control of the Chicago bootlegging trade, which was very lucrative. This is another one of those mysteries that is kind of an unofficial mystery, meaning that everyone knows who was behind it. There was just no way to prove it. It's pretty much a given that Capone was behind it, but for the men that actually pulled the trigger, well, that's hotly debated, and it can be any number of men employed by Capone. But at the end of the day, it was still Capone. And for that reason, it's not really a mystery, and I find it kind of dull. Seth Rich. Next, we move on from slightly boring to one that is a lightning rod of controversy. That is the murder of Seth Rich. Now, if you have listened to my channel for a while, you know I don't like to touch these because these types just get people angry. So I'll simply gloss over it. Seth Rich was an employee of the Democratic National Committee and was the victim of a homicide on July 10th, 2016. According to the police, Seth was shot twice in the back at 4.20 a.m. in the Bloomingdale neighborhood of Washington, D.C. in what police said was a botched robbery. His murder would become the center of many right-wing conspiracies. And honestly, it's just too mind-numbing to read over them. I think the main gist was Hillary was supposed to be behind the murder, but I just can't be bothered to look it up. Chances are you have done made your mind up one way or the other on this one. Stephen Smith Around 4 a.m. on July 8, 2015, a passerby would notice the remains of a young man in the middle of Sandy Run Road in Hampton County, South Carolina. The person would immediately dial 911, and once investigators arrived on the scene, they noticed a severe wound to the young man's head. Upon taking the young man, who was later to be identified as 19-year-old Stephen Smith, to the medical examiner's office. His cause of death would be ruled as a hit and run. They mostly came to this conclusion because Stephen's shoulder had been partially dislocated, as well as ruling that his head wound came from blunt trauma. The state trooper that was first to arrive disagreed, though, and said the whole scene was staged and that Stephen was placed there. The medical examiner would then tell detectives one other interesting tidbit, and that was that Stephen had suffered no other minor bruises on his body. Which was definitely curious, because how could you be hit hard enough by a car that you get a dislocated shoulder and a head wound, yet no other part of the body had the slightest bruise? In addition to this, was the fact that when Stephen was found, detectives noticed his shoes had been tied very loosely, which was made more intriguing, because his vehicle was about three miles up the road. Furthermore was the rumor mill that was swirling around Hampton County. This rumor said that Stephen was spotted walking down the highway when a group of people drove up and spotted Smith. This group of people did not like what Stephen was doing, and whatever that was has still not been disclosed. Although it's been hinted at by detectives that it could be related to the fact that Stephen was openly gay in this small town, this group of individuals would then do something that led to Stephen's death. One detective has even went as far to state that he was sure that this was not a hit and run. Now Stephen's death, as tragic as it is, didn't make the iceberg just because it's unsolved. The real reason it's on here is because of its possible ties to the Murdoch family scandal. And that scandal, I honestly don't even know where to start. It's a case with conspiracy, addiction, theft and murders, possibly even Stephen's murder, and it involved a powerful South Carolina family in the middle of it all. Now that case, I just can't get into with this format. It's too deep of a case. But there's a podcast about it and tons of videos on it if you would like to know more. I'll try to sum up so we can explore Stephen's case. The Murdoch's, as I said, are a prominent family in South Carolina. From 1920 until 2006, three different members of the family served as a district attorney in the state's 14th Circuit Court. The family is also famous for their nationally known law firm, but since 2014, the patriarch of the family, Richard Murdoch, who goes by Alex, has been involved in murders, corruption, insurance fraud, defrauding clients, theft of insurance payouts, drug-related charges, as well as his son Paul, who would be implicated in the death of Mallory Beach, 
after Pa would drunkenly crash the family boat in 2019 and killed her. But, Pa would never go to trial because he was murdered, along with his mother Maggie, and Alex, again, would be eventually charged for both of their murders. And it's also worth noting here at this point that the family had a longtime housekeeper, Gloria Satterfield, who died from a head injury in the Murdoch home after a suspicious fall. Now that all that is out of the way, let's get back to Smith, since he is the subject of the iceberg. As mentioned, he died from blunt force trauma, and his case was originally ruled a hit and run, but Smith was openly gay, and was a high school classmate of Alex Murdoch's oldest son, Buster. Pretty much from the onset of the investigation, witnesses would tell detectives that Buster and Stephen were in a relationship, or at the very least, extremely close friends. And furthermore, that one or more people in the Murdoch family was involved in a cover-up, and they were possibly trying to interfere with the investigation. In fact, Stephen's mom would state in later interviews that Stephen had spoke of a boy that he had a, quote, fling with, end quote, and that the two had planned on going on a trip in July. But of course, Stephen died before then. His mother would then go on to state that she had been told that the boy was one of the ones involved in Stephen's murder. And by the summer of 2021, after the arrest of Alex Murdoch for the murder of his son and wife, detectives would reopen Smith's case, stating that they had come across some new information while investigating the Murdoch murders. However, the Smith's family lawyer a few months later stated that after hiring a private investigator, they found new leads and the Murdoch family wasn't involved. The case still remains unsolved. Stone Chambers of New England. Now these are the mysteries that I love. If you live in the New England area of the United States, you have no doubt heard or seen the old stone walls that pretty much run all over the area. But a lot of you may have never heard about the stone chambers that are in the area. There are 800 of these stone-built chambers that are scattered all over New England, but they've also been found in other states, such as New York, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Ohio, Virginia, West Virginia, and Kentucky. Around the 1930s is when historians finally started looking into where these chambers actually came from. Generally, they are circular and rectangular, and are about 10 to 30 feet long, and about 10 feet wide and 10 feet tall. The most elaborate ones have a conical shape and feature smoke holes for ventilation. Some even have shelves and benches built into the walls, and they are usually built into the hillsides. Although they have a lot of similar features, their construction varies widely. They also differ from all the other colonial built structures at the time, such as burial vaults. Historians and archaeologists have claimed that the early colonists used them as root cellars, while others have speculated that the Indians built them but an even more unbelievable theory is that these were built by ancient European travelers from the Bronze Age. As far as the colonist theory goes, it is very possible that they used them for a root cellar, settler's quarters, smokehouse, shelter, animal pens, whiskey storage, hunting enclosures. There could actually be numerous uses for them. But in the early writings made by the New England colonists, they mentioned that these stone chambers were already in existence when they got here. They often called them Indian forts. Secondly, there's the simple question that kind of just kills the colonial theory. And that is, why would these colonists build these root cellars made of stone that would take considerable effort and manpower to move and then make them so elaborate when they could have just dug an ordinary root cellar and used the trees that were in abundance? It just doesn't make sense. Secondly, the theory that the natives built them has been pretty much discredited too. For one, there is no archeological evidence that shows any Indian group in the area undertook this level of stone building. Furthermore, is the area that the chambers are located at, well, they're in areas that the tribes were known only to hunt and fish or do other short-term activities at, but not stay at. They would go back home, which was usually near a river or a lake. And as far as the Bronze Age European traveler theory goes, well, that was speculated by Harvard professor Barry Fell, a now deceased marine biologist who believed the chambers were built by the ancient Celts. His reasoning for this was an inscription he found which he believed to be ancient Celtic script, while also citing other evidence such as stone circles, symbolic markings, Celtic place names, and certain chamber features. However, he is largely discredited by archaeologists. Terra Calico On September 20th, 1988, 19-year-old Terra Calico would go on her daily bike ride along New Mexico State Road 47, at around 9.30 a.m. She was sometimes accompanied by her mom, but this day she went alone, and before she left, she had asked her mother 
if she did not return by noon to come get her, as she was set to meet her boyfriend at 12.30. And when Tara did indeed fail to return, her mother would go drive the route that Tara normally took, but up on riding this lone stretch of road, she did not see Tara. Her mother Patty immediately suspected something and went to call the police. And there was good reason to be suspicious too, because at one time, she used to ride with Tara quite a bit, but Patty would stop these rides, as men would often drive by and catcall them. And one day, Patty felt like a man was stalking her. Tara felt that her mother was just being paranoid and continued to ride, and even neglected to carry mace as her mother recommended. The police would come out after the phone call and search. They would actually end up finding Tara's Sony Walkman and cassette tape, which were laying on the side of the road. Some think this was dropped intentionally at the location by Tara in an effort to mark her trail for anyone that might look for her. Detectives also found bike tracks and a spot where a scuffle might have taken place. Detectives would start an investigation and found that several motorists passed Tara on her bicycle that morning, which that bicycle has never been seen again either. But not surprisingly, no one's seen Tara get abducted or assaulted or anything like that. However, several witnesses did spot a light colored pickup truck, possibly a 1953 Ford with a camper shell driving closely behind her. And although this is a bad enough story already, that's not the reason it's on this iceberg. Almost a year later, on June 15th, 1989, a woman in Port St. Joe, Florida, would go to a local convenience store. Upon getting out of her vehicle and making her way across the parking lot, she would notice a photo lying on the blacktop. When she picked it up, she seen an unidentified young woman and boy, both gagged with black duct tape and seemingly bound. The picture lined a spot where a white windowless Toyota cargo van had been parked when she pulled up. She would later tell police that the man was in his 30s and had a mustache, and she called the police quickly too. They even set up roadblocks, but they missed the van. Detectives would contact Polaroid, who would state that due to the film they were using, the photograph had to be taken after May of 1989, almost a year after Tara had vanished, and you have probably already figured this out. But that photo was believed to be that of Tara and a still unknown boy. The photo was actually shown on a TV show called A Current Affair. And it was after this that relatives started calling Patty saying the victim looked like Tara. Tara's parents would meet investigators and she noted that a scar on the woman's leg looked identical to the one Tara had received in a car accident. Additionally, the book My Sweet Audrina that lay beside the girl in the photo was one of Tara's favorite books. Scotland Yard would analyze the photo and would conclude that they were 85% sure that it was Tara, while Los Alamos National Laboratory disagreed, and the FBI's analysis was inconclusive. But that haunting photo, well, it's never been conclusively proven to be Tara. Furthermore, investigators aren't even sure if that photo is what it appears to be, or if it is something staged, for who knows what reason. Since 2008, the line of thinking on this case has changed quite a bit. The story about what happened to Tara has been told by a few different people now. One was a deathbed confession, another from Sheriff Rene Rivera, who claimed he didn't have the evidence for an arrest, but knew what happened. These stories vary somewhat, but what we do know is this. A couple of teenagers drove up behind Tara, most likely boys that she went to school with, and started trying to talk to her and touch her, or just plain be annoying, and accidentally hit her bike. The story after this is where everything deviates. Some accounts say she threatened to call the police and they panicked and killed her. Some say that she died after they accidentally bumped her and they hid the body. Some say that she just got injured but didn't die. The boys panicked and called two other friends who helped murder her. Finally, the last version of this story is that the boys just straight up hit her and took her to another location where they sexually assaulted and then killed her. This version of the story also states that it was covered up by a deputy sheriff and later sheriff named, wait for it, Rene Rivera, the same sheriff that said he knew who was behind it, and he allegedly covered it up because his son was involved. The case still remains unsolved. The most mysterious song on the internet. This mystery is about a song that was recorded most likely in the 80s, whose origin, author, song title, and original recording date are all still unknown. Although this song has become unofficially known by the title, Like the Wind, the song was broadcast in an unknown date believed to be in 1983 or 1984 and was recorded by a man named Darius S. He recorded the song to a cassette tape along with some other songs 
which were mostly songs that came out around 1984, Darius Thin, as many people did back in the 80s, would purposely remove the dialogue from the radio host so he would have just the songs, thereby inadvertently erasing any details about the song's title and author. In 1985, Darius created a playlist consisting mostly of unidentified songs in his collection. He would then digitize that in 2004. He would eventually get a website domain from his sister, where he would post his playlist, and in 2007, his sister Lydia would bring the search to the internet in hopes that someone could identify the song. However, it wasn't until 2019 when this mystery went viral, as a Brazilian teenager would upload a snippet of the song to YouTube and then uploaded it to other music-related communities on Reddit, before eventually creating the subreddit r slash the mysterious song. As of today, the song has still not been identified, but if you're interested, there's a ton of videos on YouTube about the mystery, as well as the song itself. The Westfield Watcher This creepy mystery was recently featured on a Netflix series in October of 2022, so I assume most of you have already watched it, or at least familiar with it. In June of 2014, Derek and Marie Broadus, along with their three children, would move into their new home in Westfield, New Jersey. Westfield, up to this point, had been named one of the best places to live in America. But the Broadus family, well, they would end up disagreeing with this assessment. Because three days after closing the deal on their new home, they would receive a strange letter in the mail. It was addressed to the new owner and welcomed the family to 657 Boulevard. But although the letter started nicely, it began to get bizarre. Quote, 657 Boulevard has been the subject of my family for decades now, and it approaches its 110th birthday. I have been put in charge of watching and waiting for its second coming. It is now my time. Do you know the history of the house? Do you know what lies within the walls of 657 Boulevard? Why are you here? I will find out. End quote. The writer would go on to identify the family's minivan the renovation plans, and even details about the children. There was no identifying marks on the letter. The writer simply signed it as The Watcher. Derek wasted no time contacting the police, who in turn would open an investigation. Derek would meanwhile contact the previous homeowners. That family, named the Woods family, had received a similar letter just days prior to moving out. The writer had stated then, too, that he was watching that family from afar. However, this was the only letter they had gotten in the 23 years of living there. Maria would decide to stay with the children in her previous home, while Derek continued renovations. But things got stranger, like torn signs from their yard and another letter arriving, this time calling the homeowners by name and noting the changes they had made to the house. The watcher would even list the children by birth date and nickname, and even ask about one of the children painting on the porch. Quote, is she the artist of the family? End quote. Then they followed up with, quote, All of the windows and doors in 657 Boulevard allow me to watch you and track you as you move through the house. Who am I? I am the Watcher and have been in control of 657 Boulevard for the better part of two decades now. The Woods family turned it over to you. It was their time to move on and kindly sold it when I asked them to, end quote. Derek and his family would return to their old home after this and waited on investigations. They would even hire a former FBI agent and security firm to find the writer's identity. Yet despite this, the attempts failed. And just a half year later, the family decided to sell the home. But because the rumors had gotten out about the house, no one wanted to buy it. The Broadus family decided to just tear the home down and rebuild it. But this set the watcher off, who threatened that if they went through with their plan, quote, maybe a car accident, maybe a fire, Maybe something as simple as a mild illness that never seems to go away but makes you feel sick day after day after day after day. Maybe the mysterious death of a pet. Loved ones suddenly die. Planes and cars and bicycles crash. Bones break. You wonder who the Watcher is? Turn around, idiots. End quote. With this threat, they would cancel the plans to tear the home down. They would eventually sell the home at a half a million dollar loss. So who was this weirdo sending letters? Someone mentally ill? Was it a next-door neighbor? Or possibly someone who had petty issues with the previous homeowners? Was it the Broadus family themselves? And what about the Circleville letter writer? Did anyone check to see what he was up to during this? Okay, that last one was a joke. But to this day, the case remains unsolved. Although most people now lean to the idea that it was all done by Derek Broadus. Tomb of Genghis Khan 
Chances are, you know the name Genghis Khan, or Genghis Khan, and you probably know he was a leader for the Mongol Empire, which conquered about 18% of the world's landmass and about 31% of the world's population. But because this happened so long ago, and because it happened in the East, it's really hard for people to fathom just how destructive the Mongols were. It is believed they are directly responsible for about 38 to 60 million deaths alone, which was about 11% of the world's population at the time. Persia and Hungary alone lost around 2 million people each from their invasions, but we know all about that. What we don't know is, how did Genghis Khan die, and where was he placed afterwards? It's been the subject of much speculation. According to legend, he asked to be buried without markings or any sign, and that he wanted his body returned to Mongolia. Khan would die in 1227, and even just a few decades later, when Marco Polo came through, the Mongols at the time had no idea where he had been buried. Another issue with his burial site is just the amount of legends that surround it. Marco Polo would state that 2,000 slaves had attended his funeral, but were then killed by the soldiers that were sent to guard them. But then those soldiers were killed by another group of soldiers, which killed anyone that crossed their path on the way to bury Khan. This has been pretty much proven false, though. But there's other stories as well, such as the Mongols re-diverted a river to flow over his grave, making it impossible to find, which is probably just someone copying the story of the Sumerian king Gilgamesh. Another legend states that his grave was stampeded over and over by many horses, then the Mongols planted trees over it, while other sources claim that his coffin was empty when it arrived back in Mongolia. Likewise, other tales claim that only his shirt, tent, and boots arrived. Legends aside, most modern researchers believe he is buried somewhere near the Mongol sacred mountain, Birkin Kaldun. It was said that this is the place where Genghis Khan would go to pray to the sky god Tengri before embarking on his campaign to unite the Mongols and Steppe peoples. After the rise of the empire, no one could visit this area unless they were the Mongol royal family. There are still a few searches that pop up now and again looking for his tomb, but the Mongolian government has always been reluctant to let anyone do excavations in the region. Also is the fact that since he was buried without a marker, just like other Mongols, it's likely that he will never be found. It's even possible that his grave has already been found, and the researcher just didn't know that it was him. Uncanny Valley Origins I've already covered this one. It's in my video entitled, Most Obscure Conspiracy Theories Iceberg Part 1. You can go there by clicking the link in the upper right hand corner. Vila Incident On September 22nd, 1979, an American Vela satellite, which carried various sensors designed to detect nuclear explosions, would do just that. It would record a double flash, which would be characteristic of an atmospheric nuclear explosion of 2 to 3 kilotons in the Indian Ocean between the Crozet Islands and the Prince Edward Islands. The U.S. Air Force would fly 25 sorties to the area of the Indian Ocean to carry out atmospheric testing. They found that wind patterns confirmed the fallout from an explosion in the southern Indian Ocean could have been carried from there to southwestern Australia. Shortly after this, sheep in western Australia would be found with low levels of iodine-131, which is a product of nuclear fission. After the event became public knowledge, the United States Department of Defense would state that it was a bomb blast or a combination of natural phenomena such as lightning, a meteor, or a glint of light from the sun which could have caused a malfunction. But by the following month, in spite of not finding any radioactive debris, the U.S. intelligence services were highly confident that it was a low-yield nuclear explosion. The National Security Council, however, would contradict this and stated the findings were inconclusive, but it did say that if it was a nuclear test, the guilty party was most likely South Africa. Up to this point, the satellites had correctly detected 41 nuclear tests which were then confirmed by testing for radioactive fallout. However, this was the first test where no fallout could be found, leading to the thought that the satellite may have just malfunctioned or been hit by a meteoroid, or as previously stated, just some kind of earthly phenomena. This was a pretty big deal at the time, because just 16 years prior, in 1963, most of the world signed a treaty called the Partial Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, which prohibited all test detonations of nuclear weapons except for those underground, which leads to the top two suspects, that of Israel and South Africa, or a joint test by the two. Well before this incident, the U.S. intelligence services had already stated that Israel most likely had nukes. After the incident, it is believed that Jimmy Carter 
the president at the time, as well as the next couple of presidents, would try to cover up the fact that it was Israel, since they were an ally of the U.S. In fact, Jimmy Carter released his White House diary in 2010, and in it he had written, quote, We have a growing belief among our scientists that the Israelis did indeed conduct a nuclear test explosion in the ocean near the southern end of Africa, end quote. The thought is that Israel chose to launch the test when they did because they thought the Vila satellite was not observing the area, as well as they launched it during a typhoon. Yet, it was detected anyways. South Africa, on the other hand, was originally believed to have been behind it, but later on, it was pretty much confirmed that South Africa was not advanced enough to test a nuclear device at that time. After these two countries are the typical suspects, the Soviet Union, who had tested in the Pacific Ocean before, India, Pakistan, and France, whose Kerguelen Islands was not far from the flash, but the evidence is so overwhelming for Israel and South Africa that the latter have been pretty much ruled out. Why Cracker Barrel Fired Brad's Wife On February 27, 2017, Bradley Bird of Corydon, Indiana, would post the following on his Facebook page, quote, To say I'm pissed off would be an understatement. After 11 years, these low lives at Cracker Barrel let my wife go. I would really like to know why, and those of you who know me these days know that I will find out. In the meantime, if any of you would like to know also, please go to their Facebook page and ask them. I would really appreciate it. Their half-assed excuse was that she wasn't working out. After 11 years, come on. The old boy is storming. You can't get people to work 40 hours these days, and her average a week was 50 to 60. Needless to say, we will be seeing an attorney soon. If anybody has a good labor attorney, please let me know. Thank you. I'd better quit now before I go too far. By the way, the lowlife who fired her was Gwen Alexander, end quote. But things wouldn't end here, and it would only ramp up in hilarity. About a week and a half later, Brad would go to the Cracker Barrel Facebook page and state, quote, Today is my birthday. Why did you fire my wife? End quote. But he wasn't finished. About another week later, he would post on Cracker Barrel's Facebook page again, quote, Why did you fire my wife? End quote. It was after this second post, the story would go semi-viral, as other commentators on the page would jump in support of Brad, also commenting they too wanted answers and justice for Brad's wife. He would begin to take a life of its own, and over the next week, more and more commenters began replying to every Cracker Barrel update with jokes and wordplay about Brad's wife. The whole ordeal would go viral on March 22nd, when comedian Amiri King posted screenshots that outlined the entire situation. The post gained 34,000 likes and reactions, and was shared over 76,000 times. This led to coverage from several media outlets. It even got a petition started at change.org, which demanded justice for Brad's wife and had around 10,000 signatures. Even though this story is funny, and the support for Brad's wife was kinda tongue-in-cheek. Cracker Barrel never did reply to the trolling, and to this day, no one knows why she was fired. Why Tyrannosaurus Rex had tiny arms? The Tyrannosaurus Rex, or T-Rex for short, has always had the reputation for being the most fearsome dinosaur, and it's kinda ironic when you look at the pathetic scrawny little arms. I mean, look at it. It has one of the smallest arm-to-body mass ratios of all the dinosaurs, and paleontologists have debated forever how the T-Rex would have even used those arms, as well as the question of what would have happened if the T-Rex would have survived a couple more million years. Would evolution have just caused the arms to disappear entirely? Before we look at this mystery, it's important to note that tiny is relative. The arms look so small because the T-Rex is so huge. The T-Rex was about 40 feet tall from head to tail, but its arms were over 3 feet long and incredibly strong. But having said that, they were still pretty limited. So what were they used for? The general thought seems to be a few different things. For one, the most general consensus seems to be that they used them to clutch prey before delivering the killing bite with its jaws. It's also thought the T-Rex probably used its arms as a way to get itself off the ground in case it got knocked over in battle. And finally, the arms were used for mating purposes. Because of these reasons, most biologists state that it is really not a mystery, that it's really simple. T-Rex's arms were proportioned the exact size they needed it to be for the species to survive. However, that hasn't ever been confirmed, which has just led to more speculation, such as, other biologists claim that due to the T-Rex's ever-evolving head size, that the dinosaur needed its arms less, and with evolution they were going away, while others think 
it was an evolutionary holdover, like wisdom teeth for humans. However, some paleontologists dispute these claims, and actually think the T-Rex would have used the claws to inflict four gashes on its prey, either after jumping on the back of the intended food, or after gripping the creature in its mouth. Yet another theory is that the arms grew shorter due to evolution, because the longer dangling arms would have been a risk to the T-Rex, due to the fighting or even an accidental bite by another T-Rex when they were frenziedly feeding on a prey. And even with all these theories, none have been confirmed. Even my theory that the T-Rex learned telekinesis was also disproven. Woman on the Severn Bridge The Severn Bridge is a bridge that goes over the River Severn, between South Gloucestershire in England and Monmouthshire in southeast Wales. The bridge was first opened in 1966, and it's the center of this next strange mystery. On the night of November 27, 1988, police would come up on a girl wandering about aimlessly near the bridge, seemingly confused. She was about 5 foot 4, with reddish brown hair and blue eyes. She wore a light blue coat with a white fur collar, t-shirt and jeans, white socks and black shoes. Police would pick her up and make sure she was okay and take her back to the station. They would ask her several times who she was and where she lived, but the woman would not reply. They began to think she was deaf and mute. She was said to be between 14 and 18 years old, with most thinking that she was around 15, and she had been seen in the area before, at around midnight. The police would take her to the hospital, where doctors were also unable to get her to speak. The following day, the police would put out a national missing notice. Shortly later that day, her parents would come to pick her up. They had recognized her immediately from the national notice that had been released. A spokesman for the family would state that she was not deaf and mute or mentally ill. Apparently she was just in a deep depression and that she was 22 years old, not a teenager, and they requested that her name not be disclosed. To make this story stranger, this woman had traveled 87 miles from her home. Did she walk the entire distance herself? That was estimated to be a 30 hour continuous walk. Police did describe her shoes as being worn down really thin, which implied she did indeed walk that distance. And although the police were satisfied with the explanation of the parents, there were questions and points brought up about this case, mainly because of that walk. Such as, why was she not reported missing during this 30 hour stretch of time? especially if her parents knew she was severely depressed. Also, why did no passerby stop to help her? Author Tom Slemon would bring up another interesting question, who asked why all the police and witness accounts of the girl claimed that she was around 15. Of course, some people just look younger. But she was also described as being very petite for her age. Could it be possible that she was suffering from malnutrition? Did the police even verify her parents' story? Was this even her parents? Was a welfare check done after her return home? This would fuel rumors that the girl was a victim of abuse and had escaped, only to have some sort of breakdown, or maybe even possibly had never been out of her home before, and that after she escaped, the police only returned her back to her abusers. Well, it's also possible that, if it really was her parents, and if she was suffering from depression, she could have been suffering from an eating disorder as well, which would explain why she looked malnourished. It would also explain why the parents chose to keep her identity a secret. But what do you think? Is there something more sinister to this case? Yeti. Okay, this is another one that should have been on layer 1. It's one of the most popular cryptids out there. And it's basically just an extension of the Bigfoot stories. The Yeti, aka Abominable Snowman, is a mysterious bipedal creature and it's said to live in the mountains of Asia. The creature is mostly known from its tracks that it leaves in the Himalayan snow line. It is said to be muscular and has dark grayish or reddish brown hair and weighs between 200 to 400 pounds. It is relatively short compared to the North American Bigfoot, with estimates around 6 feet tall. The history of the Yeti goes way back, with stories that even Alexander the Great, in 326 BC, after conquering the Indus Valley, would demand that the local people bring him a Yeti, after he heard so many stories about the creature, yet they told him the cryptid could not survive in the low altitude. There have been many expeditions over the years to Russia, China, and Nepal in search of the Yeti, yet no conclusive proof has ever been found. But there are numerous witness accounts, as well as footprints that have been found and continue to be found. There's also many video recordings and pictures of the creature, which have always been disputed, and a lot of these have been proven to be a hoax. The last mainstream Yeti story came from April 2019, as an Indian Army Mountaineer and Expedition Team claimed to have found Yeti footprints 
measuring up to 32 by 15 inches near their base camp. While skeptics claim that the sightings are nothing more than a misidentification of a bear or a yak. In fact, pretty much every Yeti hair that has been found and tested has always came back to be the hair of a bear. But what do you guys think? Thanks everyone who has made it all the way through. We have now finished the first two layers on our journey. I hope you have enjoyed it as much as I.